recall the first time I learned about the execution of a man named Jesus. I was a senior in high school, and a friend invited me to go see a movie called The Passion of the Christ. I thought, sure, it sounds like a weird title, but I'll go see that movie. Now, I was not familiar with any stories in the Bible, including the life of Jesus, so for most of the movie, I didn't really understand what was going on. But when I got to the scene of the execution and they began nailing Jesus to the cross, I slid down in my chair so that I could barely see the screen over the person in front of me. And I struggled to watch as they vividly depicted the brutality of this type of execution. Now, when the scene was finally over, I was relieved. And I left the theater that day with a mix of sorrow and uncertainty. And I remember thinking, why in the world did they make a movie about this? Now, it wouldn't be until three years later that I was introduced to the cross, but this time it would take on a completely different meaning. This time I wouldn't feel confused, but I would feel hope. But with that said, to this day, when I think about the cross, there is still a level of mystery and curiosity around it. And this week, as I've been studying and meditating on the suffering of Jesus, I have asked questions about how is it possible for God to be crucified? And why did the cross need to take place? And what does it tell us about God that he did go to the cross? And perhaps you have asked those same questions at different points in your walk with God. Or maybe you've asked those questions as someone just observing Christianity from a distance because you're curious about how it all works. Well, as we enter the final week before we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, it is important for us to pause so that we can meditate on the questions regarding the cross. And my hope today is that we will not merely walk away from our time thinking about how sad the suffering of Jesus is, but that we will walk away having a profound appreciation for the cross and what the cross declares about who God is. Now, the passage we are reading today is found in Luke 23, 32. You can join us there and prepare. But before we begin reading together, I want to give us some review about what Jesus has experienced up to this point. Now, after the Passover celebration, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and where he was brought before the religious leaders and they questioned him about who he was. And when Jesus answered them, they became so angry that they spit in his face and they beat him and then they threw him in a damp prison chamber for the night. And then the next day, the religious leaders brought him before the Roman official Pilate where he stood trial and was sentenced to be executed through crucifixion. But before he was crucified, Pilate said, you know what, let's send him to be flogged. So this is when a person is whipped repeatedly and they're beaten with either a stick or a whip. And so by this point, we can be confident that Jesus has severe wounds. He was dehydrated, he was hungry, exhausted, and in excruciating pain. But his procession to the cross was not done. After the flogging, the soldiers carried him away where they stripped him of his clothing, they twisted together a crown made of thorns, and then they jammed it into his head and continued to hit and mock him. And then it would be at this point, after everything that Jesus has been through, that Jesus would be commanded to carry the patibulum, or the cross beam, that would be used for the crucifixion. Now, part of the punishment of the prisoner who was to be crucified was that they were expected to carry their own beam to the place of execution. But because of the injuries that Jesus had suffered, Luke tells us in verse 26 that he was unable to carry his crossbeam. So the Roman soldiers fo forced a bystander named Simon to carry the beam and follow behind Jesus to the procession to the place of crucifixion. And this is where we pick up our reading. Join me in Luke, starting in verse 32. So two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes 
by casting lots. Well, let's pause here to reflect on this section. You know, one of the things about our Christian faith is that it's incredible, but it is first and foremost shocking because we worship a crucified God. Verse 33 says that when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there. Now next week, we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But before we do that, we must sit with the shocking reality that God was killed. And he wasn't just killed, he was unjustly tried and murdered. Like this is an uncomfortable truth to sit in, which is why throughout the last 2,000 years, there have been attempts to change the narrative of Jesus' death. There are Gnostics that suggested that someone last minute took Jesus' place at the cross. Um, In the Quran, it suggests that the idea of a crucified Messiah is a monstrous falsehood. And although they believe that Jesus is a prophet, they do not believe in his Messiahship because of the cross. And there have also been apocryphal gospels that were written to create a different outcome for Jesus. See, the cross of Jesus is an uncomfortable truth. And I think one of the reasons why we attempt to change the narrative of Jesus on the cross is because the idea that God could be crucified by his own creation is both scandalous and shocking. And it begs the question, why did it have to happen this way? Like, is this just a fable? But the eyewitness accounts of the gospels, they make it clear that not only did Jesus die, but he was not spared from the cross. In fact, in the early church, this was a vital point of their proclamation of faith. In the first few chapters of the book of Acts, Peter talks about this a lot. In Acts 2.22, he says this, "'This man was handed over to you "'by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, "'and you, with the help of wicked men, "'put him to death by nailing him to the cross.'" And in Acts 3.15, it says, you killed the author of life. Acts 5.30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. And then in Acts 7, Stephen, the first martyr, he spoke these words right before he was killed. He said, was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. See, the early church, they did not shy away from this shocking truth that there was a crucified Messiah. And here's why this is so important for the early church and for us today. Because if there is, in order for there to be a celebration of victory in the resurrection, there must be be the reality that Jesus died on the cross. But that still leaves us wondering, why? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, let's continue reading our passage to look further into this mystery, starting in verse 35. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah and chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. This is a dark and vulgar moment as Jesus hangs on the cross. We read that three different groups of people ridicule and taunt Jesus to save himself. Now, the first group that Luke identifies are the rulers. These were the religious leaders that had had Jesus arrested in the first place. And it says that the rulers sneered at him and they said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. So what these religious men are doing in this moment is that they are using the title of Messiah and Chosen One to mock Jesus because for them, the Messiah would reflect glory and honor, not shame and suffering. See, in their mind, there is no way that Jesus is the Chosen One because God's Messiah would not be hanging on a cross. And then we have the second group of people that were ridiculing Jesus, which was the Roman soldiers. 
Now these soldiers, they were used to the brutality of the crucifixion. In fact, during the slave rebellion led by Spartacus in 71 BC, we have note that the Romans crucified more than 6,000 slaves. Like, can you imagine? It's truly incomprehensible, but these soldiers, they were numb to the job that they were entrusted to do. And what I want us to take note of is that at crucifixions, it did not draw a big crowd. Like perhaps there was a few family members present for the person being crucified, but for the most part, people would avoid witnessing this type of capital punishment. But this time, it was different. People were coming from all over to witness it. And now that there was this amphitheater of spectators, these soldiers decided to give the audience a bit of a show. And we read that they offered Jesus wine vinegar as they mocked the title that hung above his head, King of the Jews. So if he was a king, then he deserved some wine. And then finally, we have the last group that Luke describes, but this time it wasn't a group, it was just a single man. It was the criminal hanging next to him on the cross. And he said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, I don't know what kind of person you have to be to be in that kind of pain and situation where you are hanging on your own cross and you still have the nerve to talk smack to someone around you. It's wild to think about. Now, I want to point out that these three different groups that Luke describes, the religious leader, the Roman guards, the guilty criminal, he is intentionally recording this in his writing. Now, throughout Luke's crucifixion narrative, we see the number three as an overarching theme. And in this moment, as he describes three different people telling Jesus, save himself, it feels very reminiscent of Jesus' experience in the wilderness. Now, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, three years prior to this moment, he was baptized and then immediately went into the wilderness where he fasted in preparation for his public ministry. And near the end of Jesus' time in the wilderness, we read that the devil came to him and tempted him three times to abandon his position as the Son of God. But when Jesus didn't fall to temptation, Luke writes that when the devil had finished all his tempting, He left him until an opportune time. And now, as Jesus is approaching the finish line, the temptation to abandon the plan of salvation returns. See, the opportune time for the enemy has come. But this time, it's not the devil that is explicitly tempting Jesus, but the very people that he came to save. See, for this crowd of mockers, The the cross was all the proof that they needed that Jesus was not the Messiah. The Messiah that they were expecting looked and acted like an earthly king. He was handsome, strong, and valiant in everything he did. And the enemy, he whispered to their hearts, it's not possible for him to be king. What sort of king dies? What sort of king doesn't have the power to save himself? See, and when it comes to our faith today, we can or do have some of these doubts. Now there's nothing wrong with having doubts that lead to questions and curiosity, but one of the greatest temptations that we face is not to worship God for who he is, but for who we want him to be. And this is what the crowd was doing at the cross. There was no way that they would ever worship a crucified God. But as Luke is writing this gospel, he makes it clear that the cross was the very proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He would have recalled passages from the books of the prophets and the Psalms that prophesied about who the Messiah would be, what we could expect. And see, the Messiah was always described as someone that we would not recognize, someone that we would despise because we had forgotten what God truly looked like. Isaiah 53 says this about the Messiah 700 years before Jesus. It says he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. In Psalm 22, all who see him mock him. They hurled insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Does that sound familiar? to what Jesus is currently experiencing. 
See, in our broken nature, humanity craves a warrior king, someone who wields their power for the honor and glory of a select few. But Jesus came to show us the true image of God, a God that does not lead with oppressive power, but a God that leads with sacrificial love. And I think that one of the most beautiful things about God is that he's not afraid or ashamed of appearing weak. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he washed the feet of his disciples with his own hands. Now this was the lowest of low positions in that society, but he wanted to make the point that God did not come to be served, but to serve. And to this day, the implications of Jesus' servanthood and crucifixion is one of the very reasons why atheists and skeptics struggle to completely dismiss the claims of Christianity. See, in no other organized power structure do you display your weakness or the weakness of your leader as a reason to join their cause. No, instead, we hide our weakness. We hide the weaknesses of our organizations. We hide the weaknesses of our leaders, and we only display the good. Now, this reminds me of when my husband and I first started getting to know each other. I remember um, trying so hard to impress him, and one of the things that I discovered about him was that he really loved sports. Now, I, however, did not love sports. In truth, I knew very little about any sport. But um, as we started hanging out, um, I took note that he seemed to really like a team called the A's. And all I knew about the Oakland A's was that it was a baseball team. But sure enough, as we started getting to know each other, one day he asked me, hey, do you like any sports teams? So I did what any person would do in my situation. I lied. And I told him that I loved the Oakland A's. And he was like, oh, good. I'm so glad you don't like the Giants. And I was like, yeah, I can't stand those guys. But that seemed to really get him talking. <laughs> but then he asked me a follow-up question. And he said, who's your um, favorite player on the team? Now, I don't remember exactly how I responded, but it was pretty telling that I knew nothing about the A's. And in my defense, Clint also lied because he told me that he loved hiking and we went on many hikes as we were dating. But I came to find out from his mom later that he had never gone on a hike until he met me. So anyways, this is what we do, right? This is what we do as humans. We always put our best foot forward. You know, we're willing to lie to impress one another. And we hope that no one ever finds out the truth about our weaknesses. But in the Gospels, we see that God not only revealed his weakness, but the death of Jesus would be the very foundation of our faith. See, Paul writes about the absurdity of this in 1 Corinthians 1, when he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. See, for the crowd of people witnessing Jesus on the cross, it seemed foolish and absurd that anyone ever thought that he was the long-awaited Messiah. But God knew that the cross would be the only way that we would ever recognize and truly understand the depth of his love. And as Jesus was hanging on the cross, one of the most unsuspecting people in our story finally recognized who Jesus truly was. Let's continue reading, starting in verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. Now remember, there was a criminal that had just slandered Jesus and was taunting Jesus. But now we have the other criminal hanging next to Jesus. He said, he rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. The only person Jesus responded to on the cross was this man. The crowd of hecklers had been prodding Jesus with their words. They were trying to get Jesus to say something, to do something. But Jesus remained silent to their violent pleas. But now he breaks his silence and he speaks to this condemned man by his side. 
Now, we don't know much about this man, but we do know that in the presence of Jesus, even as he's being executed on a cross, he believed in both Jesus' innocence and in his power to save him. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And it was this man's faith that compelled Jesus to break his silence because Jesus was always deeply moved by the faith of people. You know, one time he tenderly spoke to a woman that had touched his cloak to find healing. And when he found her, he looked at her in the eyes and he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And now in this moment, Jesus is moved by this man's faith and he tells him that he will not only save him, but he will personally be with him. Jesus said, truly I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. See, as Jesus is moments away from death, I imagine that this interaction gave him strength, the strength that he needed to complete the mission of salvation. This man, whom others saw as a worthless criminal, Jesus saw as the very reason why he had come. And the beauty of this moment is that this man has done nothing to deserve this union with Jesus. But this shows us the relationship with God was never about performance or perfection, but it was always intended to be a union for all to come near and be with their God. You know, I really needed that reminder this week. Sometimes I feel like I have to be a certain way or I have to do certain things for God to be close to me. But the truth is that God surrounds us always. Do you know today that God is with you? No matter how worthless you feel, no matter how others may view you, no matter what you have done, Jesus is with you. And how do we know this is true? Because he didn't abandon us on the cross. With his dying breath, he spoke these words to his beloved hanging next to him. Today, you will be with me. I will be your God and you will be my people. Now, perhaps you need that reassurance today. God is still with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He will not forsake you. And friends, this is one of the reasons why the cross is so important. You know, we can feel tempted in our understanding of the cross is that its purpose was to satisfy an angry God. God couldn't wait to judge the world, so he sent Jesus. But this is not the truth. See, as we're trying to understand the purpose of the cross, it is vital for us to realize that Jesus didn't save us from God. Jesus reveals God as Savior. The Apostle John describes this at the start of his gospel. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, God has always been like Jesus, just as Jesus has always been like God. But creation had forgotten who God was. We thought He was angry and disappointed with us, but that couldn't be further from the truth. All right, let's read our final portion of our passage today, starting in verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. At three o'clock in the afternoon, which was the traditional hour of prayer in Judaism, Jesus announces his final prayer. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now these words are from Psalm 31. This is a Jewish hymn of complete trust in God in the face of sorrow and suffering and death. If you're ever in the need of comfort and remembrance that God is with you, Psalm 31 is a really good one to turn to. And I can just imagine as Jesus is on the cross, he's reciting the words of the psalm over and over as he is surrendering and putting his complete trust in God. But before he took his final breath, we read that darkness covered the land. Now this darkness was a representation of the judgment that was ours to receive. 
In this moment, the penalty of every sin in the world was not poured out onto creation, but was absorbed in Christ, our crucified Messiah. And I know we tend to get a little squeamish when we talk about the judgment of God, but what we must understand is that God's judgment is righteous. It is not fueled by hate or pride, but by love and forgiveness. And if we look at John's gospel again, in John 3, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But if we continue reading, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, the righteous judgment of God is fueled by love and forgiveness, which is why Jesus stood in our place. Now, earlier I mentioned that I was grappling with the question, why did Jesus have to come? Why the cross? And what I've realized is that the answer lies in that very question. Jesus didn't have to come. He chose to come. He was not swayed out of obligation, but by love. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he stood in our place. For God so loved the world that he reconciled us to himself. Now, as we close today, instead of having a perfectly curated application, I want our next step this week to be taking some time to be with Jesus. Be with Jesus in his procession to and on the cross. Now, on the screen, you'll see references to the passion of Christ in all four Gospels. And I hope that you will choose to read one of these this week, that you'll take your time. You can read Luke, which is what we're going through. You can read any one that you choose. Maybe in the morning you wake up and you read it, or maybe you read it before bed. But another option for us is that perhaps you want to take communion. Um, I know that we do this as a church family a lot of times, but um, all you really need is bread and juice, and you can take time to reflect on Jesus' body that was broken and his blood that was shed. Maybe you need to go for a walk and breathe in the fresh air and give thanks to Jesus for the forgiveness that you have received. Maybe you need fresh perspective of the forgiveness that you've already received with that very thing you're struggling with right now. Now next week, we will have an opportunity to celebrate our living and resurrected Messiah. But let's not rush past this precious time we have to reflect on the cross and all that Jesus joyfully sacrificed for the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are the image of Christ. I thank you that when we're confused and lost about what you expect of us and what you want from us, that all we need to do is look to Christ, that your burden is light, that you love us so deeply that you chose the cross. Lord, I pray that this would bring us comfort this week and that we would spend time with your son, embracing what he had to go through so that we could have life, not in shame and guilt, but it was the joy set before him. So we rejoice in his sacrifice. And we thank you that we do worship a crucified Messiah, that even though it appears foolish, it is the wisdom of God. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Wait, wait, before you go, three things. First, please consider becoming one of Cornerstone Fellowship's financial partners. Your donations will ensure that you'll be able to continue enjoying helpful, and hopefully life-changing messages like the one you just watched. And number two, please share the link to this message with anyone who you know needs it or will be blessed by it, or post the link to your own personal social platforms. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you'll be alerted whenever we post more content. Thanks for watching.